Hi there, everyone. My name is Max Young, and I'd like to welcome you all on behalf of Roman's Bookstore to tonight's virtual event. Tonight, we are lucky to have with us author Christina Hammonds Reed in conversation with Liara Tamani, discussing Christina's book, The Black Kids. We're so grateful that all of you could make it tonight and that our bookstore is able to continue bringing you authors and their works to our community during this time. This evening's event does include a Q&A portion, so if you would like to ask Christina a question, you can go ahead and click the Ask a Question button towards the bottom, and they'll go ahead and get to that towards the end of the event. And to support Romans as well as Christina, go ahead and click that green button right down there to purchase her book. Um, and with that all out of the way, let me go ahead and introduce our authors for tonight. Uh, first off, we have Christina Hammonds-Reed, who holds an MFA from the University of Southern California School of Cinematic Arts. She's a native of the Los Angeles area, and her work has previously appeared in the Santa Monica Review and One Teen Story. The Black Kids is her first novel. And with her is Liara Tamani, who currently lives in Houston, Texas. She holds an MFA in writing from Vermont College and is the author of the acclaimed Calling My Name, which was a 2018 Penn American Literary Award finalist and a 2018 SCBWI Golden Kite finalist. Uh, so with that all out of the way, I'll go ahead and let them take over. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. I'm so excited to be with you all. You guys are like all of my local people and I grew up going to Broman, so this is like a really big deal for me. <laughs> I'm so happy. <laughs> so I think we're gonna kick off with a bit of a reading. Um, I will read to you guys from chapter five of The Black Kids and a little bit of context. Um, this is right as the riots are getting underway. So this is really the first, right after the the, the officers have been acquitted. Um, we start right here. Oh no, I usually open right to it. There we go. Lucia and I stand in line at Western Union behind a balding Russian man with really long ear hair like my old piano teacher. Save for the television in the corner, it's quiet, eerily so, and I try to keep my feet perfectly still so my sneakers won't squeak on linoleum. Sometimes, when I have to pee really badly or when I can't make a sound, I pretend that I'm a runaway slave and have to be very still or else I'll be discovered. It's fucked up, but it works. Usually, this place is a swirl of tongues and transactions, like waiting at the airport but without any of the excitement of going somewhere. There's always some baby fussing while some mom screams, get down from there, that's the kid which sounds pretty much the same in any language. Today, it's just me, Lucia, and the bald man. Together, we watch as the crowd pulls a white man from his truck and begins to beat the shit out of him. His long blonde hair swings from side to side as he staggers, disoriented with each blow. In a different world, he'd be a lead guitarist rocking out, not a broken construction worker tumbling. A man flashes gang signs at the helicopters above. They're not even 10 miles away, but it might as well be a whole different country. They're my fancy school and my fancy neighborhood. And then there's this. The television flickers and fragments across the Russian's head as he shakes it. He turns to look at me angrily. See, he says. Lucia places her body between the two of us. No habla con él, she says. The man returns to the screen. Lucia speaks to me in Spanish when she doesn't want white people to easily understand what we're talking about. She taught me when I was younger and then as soon as we got a chance to study languages in school, I chose Spanish. And anyway, it's LA. If you even half pay attention to the city around you, you'll learn by osmosis. It's not like it's a secret language, but it's easier for her and easy enough for me. I'm sure to everyone looking at us, we're an odd pair. A lanky black teenager and a tiny Guatemalan always together. Lucia's favorite cashier is Jose. If he's working, everything goes smoothly and they joke and laugh in Spanish about how he's going to marry her. When she's done, she kisses her fingertips and places them on the envelope before sliding it across the counter where Jose converts it to a textbook for Umberto, guitar lessons for Roberto. Today, Jose isn't in a joking mood. El mundo en que vivimos, Jose sighs. His eyes are fixed on the television screen where the news shows images of a man slabbing, slamming a slab of concrete down on the truck driver's head. See, si, Lucia says. Jose's hair is the dark of an oil slick at night. He's younger than Lucia and Mexican, not Guatemalan. He lives with his cousin and abuelita in a small house in Highland Park with three bedrooms and a bathroom. And if you climb up on his roof, you can see the city on a clear day. He sounded like a real estate agent when he told this to Lucia. I'm going to own my own business, he said last week, a declaration of intent. Doing what, she said. He wants to own one of those places downtown where they sell Cobia San Marcos and clothing and keychains and Coca-Cola and glass bottles. 
The San Marcos blankets are super plush and have different designs on them, like cute kittens and majestic lions and strawberry shortcake and the Dodgers. A few weeks ago, Lucia took me downtown and had me pick one out. The air downtown is always a color of a nasty loogie, but I like the buildings because they've got character, which is also why I love the blankets. The one I chose had a white tiger on it, lounging like a queen. You take it with you when you go to college, Lucia said, and it was like she was preparing us both for goodbye. I wish I could take you with me to college, I joked, and we laughed, <laughs> and I felt kind of bad because it made it seem like Lucia was my personal servant. When I was younger and had a nightmare, I would walk downstairs to Lucia's room and crawl into bed with her, and she would tell me stories about her boys and her country and the handsome but very bad man devil she divorced before she ran to the United States. He did unforgivable things, she said, for what he thought were the right reasons. She used to think so too, until she didn't. And so he became the villain in my bedtime stories. Tell me about Oturo who lives in the house by the bridge, I'd say. Jose is not like Oturo, I say to Lucia. Jose's a good man. What's a good man, Lucia sighs. They're all good until they're not. But I see the way she looks at Jose, like maybe she'd like to sell Cobia some clothing and knickknacks and coke and glass bottles with him. Like maybe she could sit up on his roof, cuddle up in a blanket and watch the fireworks over Dodger Stadium. I can see her dreaming up their life together and deciding maybe they could be good. I wonder if she's going to tell him today that she's leaving soon. Although I try not to watch, my gaze finds its way back to the television screen. The truck driver lies on the ground in a halo of his own blood and hair. Nobody goes to help him. The police are nowhere to be found. Some man walks up, takes the wallet right from the truck driver's pocket and runs off. Finally, the truck driver gets to his knees and another man comes up almost out of nowhere and appears to kick him in the head. I feel myself wince. Go out with me, Jose says to Lucia. It's the first time he said it for real and not just as a joke. On the television, the man drags himself into his truck and tries to drive away. The people at the intersection continue to throw anger at passing cars. From up above, it looks like somewhere I've driven through a thousand times, but also somewhere I've never been. I bet my dad would know where it is. Okay, Lucia says softly to Jose. And I look over at her because she's going home to Guatemala and what's even the point of going on a date when you're gonna leave? But maybe that bloody truck driver made her forget. Or maybe he reminded her to why she left. Or maybe being around Jose makes her think she might want to stick around a little bit longer. He completes the rest of the transaction in silence. On our way home, as we cross the street, Lucia reaches for my hand like she used to when I was little. And even though I haven't done so in a long time, I hold it. By the time we get home, the city is burning. The buildings are stripped bare and people yank the guts through their skeletons. Lucia hands me a small envelope. The cats have said it was accidentally delivered to them and they kept forgetting to bring it over. You open it, I say. My heart feels like it's going to fall right out my chest and splat right on the kitchen floor. It's your future, Miha. The envelope says my future has been waitlisted. I want to cry. I'm in at other schools, really good schools even, but Stanford is the school I want. Close to home, but far enough away to be some other me. Somewhere I can briefly stop being a sister and a daughter, but only an hour's flight away in case Joe needs me. I don't know for what exactly, maybe in case her broken brain delivers a rough uppercut and she needs me to pull her up, squirt some water in her mouth, ice her bruises, and tell her to keep fighting. I need to be somewhere I can still feel the ocean, my ocean, and my skin and hair. I'm convinced Stanford is the only place I'll thrive. I want to throw up. I want to disappear. I want to crawl into a hole with embarrassment. I feel all of these things and burn up in their atmosphere as I hurtle down. Lucia pats me on the thigh. Everything will work out all right. Instead of crying, I watch. Up goes a shoe store, up goes a laundromat, up goes a TV repair store, up goes a mattress store, up goes a liquor store, all of it goes up. My mother calls me from her car phone. It's going to be a while. I'm gonna to try to take the 101 to the 405 and see if that's better. I'm afraid to get on the 10. My father calls me from his car phone. I'm okay, I'll get there when I get there. It's bad, really bad, stay home, okay? Promise you won't go out with your friends tonight, not tonight. I promise. I call Joe from our living room. The phone rings and rings and I'm afraid she's not there, but she is. Are you okay? I ask. Of course I'm not. It's so wrong. I'm so tired of this shit. They have the goddamn evidence right in front of their faces. It was right there, Ashley. I mean, they don't fucking see us even when they're looking right at us. Usually when Joe goes on about one of her causes, it feels so far away. Like she's angry because she knows she should be and not because she actually feels that shit in her kidneys. But this, this feels different. 
Even I feel it's somewhere in my innards pulsing. You should come home, I say, until everything's blown over. I'm not leaving Harrison here alone, she says. Stupid Harrison. Just because he maybe survived tetanus doesn't mean he can save her from everything else. Just bring him here with you. I'm not subjecting him to mom again after what happened at dinner. Is it him you're really concerned about or you, I say. She doesn't respond. Joe, don't do anything stupid, please. I think of her handcuffed near a high school flagpole fighting for brown people halfway across the world. She spent her suspension calling our local congressperson. Joe's the kind of person who would accidentally find herself in the middle of somebody else's riot. Dude, what the hell, Ash? The phone clicks, and then my sister's gone. I wish, yeah. Thank <laughs> you for that. Let me say, you just you took me all the way back with this book. Um, I, I'm a '90s baby. I'm an, I grew up in the '90s, and I was actually a freshman in high school um, when the Rodney King verdict, yeah, came down. And it's crazy because you read this book and it and it feels so current, even though it's historical, because you know not nothing has changed, but we have not made a lot of progress. Um, <laughs> what what um, what made you choose the Rodney King riots as a background for this book? So I think multiple things, but really it felt like the riots are really one of the first times that we see a civilian bystander capture inst an instance of police brutality and then have that footage broadcase um, live in that way for everybody to see. So it felt like one of the precursors to mm. what we're very accustomed to over the last decade, right? Like over the last decade, smartphones have made it so that we really see um, police brutality and the deaths of browns and brown and black people at the hands of police um, far more frequently than ever before. Um, and so this felt like a way to use the past to hold the mirror up to the present. Yeah. And I did not even know in writing it just how much it was going to reflect our reality in 2020. Like it's it's a little mind boggling, but it's also not, right? Like I feel like it, it, it's not and it is. Um, and I also wanted to have a, a book that really examined class and privilege as well as race against the backdrop of this. Yeah. Um, and so it's like this huge moment in our local history but Ashley's feeling removed from it because of her degree of privilege. And, and that was kind of a perspective that it was interesting to me to explore and, and to really, um, to showcase the intersectionality of these different identities and how they come together or don't come together in that way. Yeah, no, I love the way, it's like you have this background of the race riots, but then, you know, up against that is just, Ashley's just a teenager, you know, <laughs> just trying to, <laughs> trying to make it, trying to figure things out. You know? And so you have this history and you have th these, her trying to figure things out. And then, like you said, you are also examining along with race, you are examining class because she is very wealthy. She is very privileged. Mm -hmm. She's so privileged that she, you know, when she talks about the black kids at the beginning of the book, she does not consider herself as one of them. Obviously she knows she's black, but she does not identify with her blackness as much or, you know, celebrate it or, you know, she's hanging out with a, you know, a white crowd and, um, and she almost feels uncomfortable. And that's, and that's an interesting thing too, that I don't think you know, we talk about as much because from the outside, it's like, you know, white people can see black people as just, oh, black people. No, but no, <laughs> black, people. <laughs> black people are so different. And there, and there is a thing where, you know, there are a lot of people who grow up feeling outside of, you know, outside of that blackness because, you know, especially, you know, I know when I was growing up, I used to get, you know, people used to say, I talked white. Or right. you can call me black white girl, you know, all of these things. <laughs> or, <laughs> right, all of those. You know, all those things <laughs> that might make you feel on the outside. And in this book, I liked how the black kids were actually welcoming to her, you know, and you know, they weren't doing that to her. But um, yeah, she did see herself outside of that. So why was it important for you to, you know, write a character who did not own her blackness mm -hmm. from the beginning? Well, because I think it's a lot of internalized racism that she's really struggling with. Yes. It's really just her feeling like there's a way to be Black, which I think was very much the narrative 
up until kind of recently, like up until maybe within the last decade, if you just paid attention to media stereotypes of black people, just a certain kind of blackness or a certain spectrum of blackness was within what people were accustomed to. And that's never been the reality, but if you're only looking at TV or you're only watching movies and that's just what you see, you're not yeah. gonna necessarily identify the black culture in that way. Um, and it's something to a certain extent, I'm not Ashley at all, but I struggled with growing up because I didn't grow up in a predominantly black area at all. I grew mm. up in areas that were much more non-black and in school, I was always one of like the few black kids in school. Yeah. And <laughs> so, you know, like you, you kind yeah. of like, um, for me at least, I, I felt like I didn't necessarily always identify with the other black kids in my school, mm. depending on which school it was. And that was, I think, a little to do with my own perception of blackness Granted, that's also a very strange child, but <laughs> I, I think it had to do with just like my own perception of what blackness was. And so even though I'm not Ashley, I wanted to explore that through Ashley and how um, just sort of that internalized garbage can make it so that you don't relate to community or you don't seek out community. Right. And, and for me, I didn't really seek community out in that same way, I think, until college and beyond. So. Mm. Yeah, I wanted to explore that just because I don't think you really see a lot of that either. And there are some no. middle and upper middle class kids who feel the same way, where it's just sort of like they don't find the sense of belonging within their circumstances until much later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like the thing, you're not black enough, you know, mm -hmm. um, or she may not have seen herself as, you know, black enough um, which is interesting. And it's like, I guess she identified with um, being wealthy more than she identified with being black. Yeah. Yeah. And you kind of saw that with the play with uh, Morgan and her cousins. It's like, mm -hmm. I, I love that. It was like funny, but messed up. When she was like, <laughs> when she was like, when I guess, and, and we and we can talk about colorism here too, because mm -hmm. the cousin was, you know, I forget, you know, the things that, that she said to Ashley, but just talking about her skin color and, you know, always talking about, you know, her and her sister being darker. And I guess the cousins are lighter. And then mm -hmm. Ashley's response to that, she was like, well, I can't say it out loud. I forget your line. You tell me I can't say it out loud, but you poor and we rich. You know, that was basically. <laughs> It's true. And I think it's like, it's interesting to explore the intersectionalities of identity in that way, right? Like, and yeah. how, um, how different black people relate to each other. So like her cousins are lighter skinned and they have lighter skin privilege to a certain extent moving through the world, but they don't have her financial privilege. And exactly. so what does that mean for them interacting as family? Like that's, I think class differences across family are always super interesting and especially across black families, given just how uh, our racial wealth gap has made it so that you can sometimes have people within families with vastly different um, income sources. So yes, I just thought that it was also an interesting way just to kind of explore different kinds of black girlhood, right? Instead of there just yeah. being one kind or one like stereotype of what black girlhood looks like. They're all very different in terms of like her and Joe and Morgan and the other black kids in her class when she befriends them. and. I'm always interested in showcasing just how much we're not a monolith. Yeah, no, exactly. I always say there are there are billions, literally, of expressions of being black in this world. Literally, you know, <laughs> but <laughs> we seem to always see the same. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> to be black, but there are a lot of different ways to be black. <laughs> uh, but no, one thing I did love about Ashley too is that she was so human. It's like, I love that you didn't make this like perfect character who was doing all the right things and saying all the right things because I think especially as a teenager, it's not realistic, you know? Right. It's like, you know, well, she, <laughs> you gonna mess up, you know? And even she herself questioned whether like she was a good person, you know, sometimes mm -hmm. and she gets some messed up, you know, she did some messed up things, you yeah. know? Oh, you yeah. know? <laughs> and uh, oh yeah, oh yeah, with regards to Michael, you know, and oh my God, Lashawn, I was so mad at her. I was like, look, girl, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like get it together and leave that man alone. Leave that man alone. <laughs> but what do you what do you think about that? Because it's it's to me, I think too. I don't, I don't know if it's just like a YA thing, but mm -hmm. so many so many people, so, so many readers want to really like their characters. It's like 
for me, as long as a character is human and I see them going through their journey and I can relate to that human quality in them, I love that, you know. But so many people are like, well, I don't like her. <laughs> right. I was thinking the same thing in reading your book where it's just like, we both have these characters who make very big mistakes and they don't always treat each other kindly. And um, and their parents are deeply flawed people too. Like in your book, I was like, I read the bombshell and I was like, oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that, I think as writers, it's one, it's more interesting to write flawed people and yeah. it's more honest. And also I, I think, I think you're right. I think in YA traditionally it's been like our main character is more heroic than not. And that's not realistic. And I think that sometimes it's important for people to be able to see their flaws on the page as much as anything, right? Like- Oh yeah, especially for girls, you know? And especially for black girls. I feel like black yes. girls in a lot of ways aren't allowed to be sensitive and aren't allowed to be um, unsure of themselves and aren't allowed to be uh, less than the strong black woman stereotype, which a lot of girls are not. And, and we don't right. really see that. Um, as much. We don't see Black women being able to be soft and feminine and all of these things and, and to make these mistakes in this way and not have all the answers right away. And that was important to me to have a character who she hurts people and she hurts herself because she doesn't know herself. And I think that's true of so many of us when we're growing up um, and sometimes even people as adults, right? <laughs> yeah, no. So it's like hurt, hurt people, hurt people. I always say that too. It's like hurt people, hurt people. And yes, of course, if, if you don't know yourself and you're figuring everything out, you're gonna be trying things on. Mm -hmm. you know, you're gonna be trying on different behaviors. You're gonna be trying this out. You're gonna be trying that out. And in that process, it's like, you're gonna make some mistakes. And it's so important that, you know, our youth in general, but especially our black youth, our um, black girls and boys know that you do not have to be perfect, but I guess that is what, you know, it's like you, you, you hear it all the time. And even with your parents, you know, teaching the kids, it's like, you know, you have to be perfect. You know, they don't have to be perfect, but you do have to be perfect. But it's like, it's impossible. It's impossible. You know? it's such a weight to bear, right? And I think yeah. that's like going against it, which is like, I don't want to be that. I just want to be me. Um, yeah. And I think that so many of us grow up with our parents telling us that like you have to be doubly as good or triple as good or whatever the case may be. And it can be really hard when you're like, but I just want to be a stupid teenager today. Right. <laughs> you know. So, uh, yeah. I think that that's kind of what Ashley's going through. And I think it's just honest of youth, right? Like teenagerhood slash early adulthood where you need the space to make your mistakes like that's what that age is hopefully for so that you're a better yeah. as an adult exactly because you have to learn some kind of way and a lot yeah. of times it's through experience it's like you can hear other people's stories and but you have to learn you have to feel that pain and be like ouch i don't want to feel that again <laughs> or like ooh, ooh, that was bad i don't i don't want to be that person and you know cause somebody else pain like that again same i and love the her girlfriends like with her friends throughout the book it's like they hurt each other in that way because they're all experiencing their different growing pains right like it's mm -hmm. it's it's just part of adolescence. i mean we go at kimberly she i don't she wasn't a real friend you know no, I mean, <laughs> she wasn't she, she wasn't. was not she was not we're gonna take her we're not gonna call her a friend we're no not <laughs> She's she's the worst. And what Ashley does isn't okay, but Kimberly is kind of the worst. Yeah, no, it was like at that moment at the end, and it's so hard to talk about things because I don't want to give everything away. It's like, but it's like even Kimberly shocked me. She had said things earlier in the book where I was like, but even in the at the end, it's like I felt that hurt with Ashley because I was like, Ooh, no, she didn't. Like, you know, and how can you go so many years childhood, you know, through your childhood, and there's really no love there because that's not, no matter what is going on, that's not it. There, there's that, there's no love there. Um, and it's also because of how people prioritize romantic relationships over friendships from time to time. Yeah. Like, I think girls in particular are 
in the words of flawless, like they're taught to compete with each other or in the words of Chimamanda, I should say, um, you're taught to compete with each other over men or over romantic relationships. And especially for a certain kind of straight girl, I think that that's um, the sad reality of it, that it's just like you prioritize those things over your friendships. And that's what Kimberly's doing in that instance where she just goes straight for like what will cause the most hurt. To what will go yeah um as yeah. opposed to taking a step back and saying like wait a minute this relationship with her is longer than this romantic relationship mm. um but yeah yeah i like how you explored the subtle racism in that friend group too because it's like all the racism that you know black people experience it's not always this loud these moments you know especially um you know having white friends you know either with them saying the n-word and i think it's who was it kimberly was like you know you're black but you're not like blackity black. just said you're not black <laughs> <laughs> microaggressions that I think a lot of us can relate to. Like oh, yeah. I think anybody who grew up in non-black spaces as the token black friend has people in your life where you love them, they are your good friends, but they just uh, up until very recently didn't know how to navigate issues of race. Yeah. And they still don't know how to, and they're still learning these things. And I think um, now we're in a space where people are really trying to think about what they say and what they do and be more thoughtful. But in 1992, that was not the conversation. That was not, the case. Well, that was not how people were interacting with each other. So it was it was important to me to be honest to that too. Like yes, how people talk to each other now would differ from 1992. But Absolutely. the microaggressions are still something that we're all like having to deal with and navigate. And in Ashley's case, she doesn't feel comfortable being like that. That makes me feel uncomfortable because I think a lot of us in those situations are like, well, I don't want to hurt my friend. Right. They hurt me, right? Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, no, it's so true. I think that's one of the, that's one of the, when I started out at the beginning of the conversation and, say, and said not much has changed, I think that's like the biggest change. We haven't obviously because of, you know, who's in power and whatever, we haven't seen a lot of changes, um, you know, in terms of, you know, institutional change, which hopefully more of that is coming. But one thing, the conversation has changed. The conversation has changed. And I, I have witnessed too among my white friends. I mean, they are they are trying to be woke. They are out here. They are they are reading the book. They are they are a lot more sensitive. Um, you know, just to the the black experience in general. Because I know plenty of times before. You know, and I have you know some white friends that I mean I don't know you friends or associates. You don't even ever talk about race because it's like you don't even go there because you're not that close. But then I you know other friends. You know, we get all up into it and. Mm -hmm. um, you know, before I've had to say in the past, cause I'm, I'm grown now. And there's a difference being grown. If somebody's having a conversation in front of you and you know, it's wrong. I'm gonna say, look here. Um, no, that's not right. <laughs> <laughs> so they, have, they have heard it from me before, but I don't know if they're getting it. They they're getting it now, you know, in a different through way, more through different ways, you know, but of course, when you're like 17 and you're hanging out with your friends, you know, it, it's very different. It's not, you know, you don't want, it's like almost like you don't want to be that person to be like, oh, especially back then in 1992, yeah. you know, it, 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 it was a very different time. Um, but it's, I like that you, I, I like that you have that in there and that you show that difference between then and now. And of course that is still happening. It's not just then and now, of course that is still happening in small groups, um, you know, all the time. All the time. Um, one thing that we haven't touched on, and then I want to get people's questions because I'm, I'll need to keep track of the time, um, is uh, is mental health and like the just the generational trauma too, and how that's carried for. I feel like you just let me just say I feel like you just did a brilliant job. The book is so layered. I mean, you have this teenage life. And then you have the historical backdrop and you have what's going on literally across generations within a family. You have different pockets of teenagers. You know, you have, there's so much in this book to explore. But, um, you know, with the grandmother and, you know, with Joe, um, you want to talk about that a little bit or why, why you felt it was important to um, touch on mental health? 
and especially in 1992, a lot of people were not so aware of. Well, I think it's interesting because I think as black people, we really haven't had huge discussions around mental health historically. Like it's, it's getting better yeah. now. But it, up until very recently, it was something where it's like you just push through and, and you don't really tell each other about your struggles. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's multifold. I think one, there's this idea that the strong black woman or the strong black person in general, that stereotype that we've had to uphold, hasn't really allowed the space to be that vulnerable in that way or to say, I need help in that way. Yeah. Um, and there's intergenerational trauma for many of us, for many of us who have grown up in this country and have parents who've grown up in this country, grandparents have grown up in this country. They've been through some really horrific things and it, and a lot of families that doesn't get spoken about at all. And grandparents or great grandparents may not have had the resources at hand to work through whatever those issues are. Um, but there's a feeling, right? Like there's that feeling that yeah. under everything and there's even if you're not speaking about it that's then being passed on through generations um so it was really important to me to use one tulsa as a mechanism for exploring that trauma in her grandmother and how that trauma then translates across generations but also the brain chemistry right like we find out that like her grandmother struggled with mental illness that maybe was exacerbated by what happened to her, but is it brain chemistry? Is it nature, nurture? Uh, it's a bit of both, right? And so how does that then correspond to Joe in the future? How does that correspond to her dad? How does it correspond to how all of them interact with each other? And this family that like is really struggling to communicate with each other and failing in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's something that a lot of of black people can relate to where there's just like there's always something that you don't talk about or something that like oh well you know that's like that person um and i think for me it was like how do these secrets undo us as families you do that too i think it's it's yeah. so many family secrets <laughs> there right where it's just kind of how family secrets can destroy the fabric of a family and how that relates to mental health and how that relates to racism um because those things are all connected in the black experience in this country. Um, mm -hmm. Even if you are thriving in the way that Ashley's parents are in the book, that doesn't mean that you are removed from that intergenerational trauma. And, no. and yes. Yeah, and just because you are wealthy, you know, doesn't mean you are necessarily mentally healthy, you mm -hmm. know. And, you know, a lot of times people are trying to like, you know, in, in your book, you know, you're they're her dad is trying to keep it to himself because he does not want it to be passed on to her. But it's like your 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 wealth and your privilege financially does not buy you protection right. um, from racism. It does not buy you protection from um, having to come up against things that are going to um, kind of challenge you mentally or for mental health. It does not. It does not it does not protect you from any of that. It doesn't that protect you from getting into all these situations. Um, and so it's like, you want your children, it's like you want to shield them and protect them, but then you kind of have to educate them too. And you don't want to just be holding it all in either because it's like holding it all in. Like you said, an energy still gets passed down. It gets passed through. She knows her father, has not told her something and she is wanting to know it and it obviously is affecting them and it's affecting their relationship. Um, yeah. And I They're, think that's a lot of families too. Like I, I know I'm speaking specific to the black experience, but I think that's a lot of immigrants, yeah. a lot of people of color. It's a lot of um, family with queer members where it's just like you don't talk about certain things and it eats at pe the fabric of the family and, and yeah. mental health. So. Mm -hmm. I blow that up with these characters and, and hopefully I think Joe unfortunately suffers the deepest consequences as a result of all mm. of them. But yeah. hopefully moving forward there's a future for them all where they can yeah. relate to each other. <laughs> and I was gonna talk about that too. I like how there's not necessarily you don't get your happy ending, you know, and you leave it very open ended. And that's kind of how life is, right? It's not like happy ending the end, you know, it's like, you know, life goes on, life continues. 
and you kind of have to see how things work out, right? And it's a combination of different factors, how they work out. But did you, so did, obviously you wrote it and it was intentional and you did not give them a happy ending. But you, did you think, did you like, were you tempted to give them a happy ending or? No, I was tempted to go even darker. <laughs> I was tempted to go darker. And then I think it just didn't quite work in that way. Um, but to me, I wanted to straddle the line between hope and realism, right? Like, yes, realistically, everything's not okay for this family moving forward, but there is still hope at the end of it. And I think that that's kind of true to life, right? Like oftentimes you cannot be okay and still look to the future and hope that there's something better around the corner. And that also, I think, relates to specifically race in the United States. Yeah. Um, we can say that our paths were hurtful. We can say that we need to really navigate what our history has been um, and still be hopeful for the future and still be hopeful that for children and grandchildren and whomever, we're building towards a better world. Um, and I think that's kind of just how we're all feeling in 2020 too, right? Like there's- Oh, let's keep hope alive, yes. Yeah, you have something. Um, <laughs> you gotta have something to keep you going. And and, and for me, I think it's yeah. a really important, um, beautiful thing to- Absolutely, necessary, a necessary thing, hope, yeah. Yeah, okay, so I'm gonna get into the questions, y'all. So if y'all have questions, you know, start shooting them my way in the little ask a question section. So, um, okay. So did you, do you have, did you have a soundtrack while writing the black kids? And let me just say, when, when I, when I read Criss Cross will make you jump, jump. And I was like, oh yes. I was like, Criss Cross will make you jump. I like literally that took me back. And I just wanted to be like, yeah. <laughs> so that was me the entire time I was writing. So it was, it was so much fun. And I was, so I was younger during the riots. I was only eight when the riots actually happened. But I feel like eight, when you're eight, you're kind of absorbing all of pop culture like yeah. in that way. And so there are a lot of things that I remember. Um, oh, no, I'm starting to echo. Let's hope that goes away. I think it went away. OK, so there are a lot of things that like you absorb when they're that age. And so it was kind of like strolling down memory lane while in the act of writing but yeah. also YouTubing and Spotify and Apple Music and just kind of discovering songs that I had forgotten about or songs that maybe I knew but didn't necessarily know were of specifically 1991, 1992. Um, but I had the best time writing the music in it. And I also wanted music to be like a story. Um, it has kind of its own, each character has their own soundscape. So like Lana has kind of this like, punk soundscape. Um, Joe, who Ashley's trying to understand throughout the book, has very much like a funk soul um, mm. that we're dealing with with her. Like she's absorbing these like older sounds. Uh, the father definitely is singing Curtis Mayfield with his brother at the end. And we see how music bonds the two of them in terms of family. And I think it's so important. Music tends to be really important to black families in terms of how we bond with each other. Uh, across generations. Um, and so like all throughout the text, all of these different moments, as much as I enjoyed them just for fun, it was also really important character wise and, and important to like what was happening in the scene. Um, like even when she's making it with Michael and U2 is playing and it's just like, mm. what are you doing girl? Um, yeah, <laughs> come on girl, come on. Yeah. So I, I really thoroughly enjoyed creating soundtracks all the time while I was writing and mm -hmm. revising and then it just got to a point where I listened to like mostly 90s music for 90s music and the Hamilton soundtrack for like the best uh -huh. part. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I feel like 90s music is some of the best. I mean, I know people say that all the time. It's like, I, I sound old. I know when I say that, but 90s, 90s were really great in terms of music. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's different. <laughs> Okay, and another question. Um, in speaking of allowing our youth in mistakes, do you feel parents of POC harp on doing your very best because POC youth 
do not get leeway like those non POC. Yeah, yeah. I absolutely think so. I think it's it's a protective mechanism as much as anything, right? Like it's because absolutely if you mess up. There's a point in the book where Ashley's dad says to her, like, if you do anything wrong, I'm not going to bail you out. Um, and I think that's because for us, the stakes are so much higher. Like mm -hmm. traffic stops can end in death, and it, it's really any mistake you do gets amplified when you are a black person and a black young person at that. And, and, and it even goes across class, right? So I, I think that yes. kids are trying to protect their kids as much as possible. Um, but when you're a kid, you just feel the weight of that expectation. Like, you know, in theory, your parents trying to protect you. But I think Ashley is feeling so much of the burden of representation, especially when she's like one of the only ones um, in her school or in her friend circle, that she is the only person in the friend circle. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's a very, um, it's a hard tightrope to walk, I would imagine, as a parent. I'm not a parent. Yeah. Um, but, you know, yeah, it's, especially at seeing at a young age, it's like, you, you know, there's so many studies that show now, it's like, you know, how young black boys, you know, starting in kindergarten, get mm -hmm. printed get sent to the principals more often, get disciplined more often. And it's literally because it's they are being taught by teachers who don't relate to them necessarily and just see them differently. It's yeah. like, well, I think that's just, you know, we talk about, you know, the importance of, you know, just learning about your bias. It's like that has to be, you know, going forward in schools you know, teachers have to be able to recognize that within themselves, you know, um, and, you know, hopefully there's training around that. But and it gets difficult because then it's state to state and then you still have some states and some people like, what, what are you talking about, bias? What? Right. Yeah, what, bias? what bias? What are you talking yeah, about? Parents do their entire lives. Like if you get stereotyped or put into Absolutely. like a class with a slow kid class or whatever the case may be, if that happens to you when you're six, that determines people's futures. I think that like the, the bias isn't just about like, oh, you're making the kid feel bad. It's like you are literally setting that kid up to fail and yeah, your biases. So I think that that's, I mean, it's such a hard thing, I think, for black parents to have to sort through and to be able to advocate for their kids and create uh, the conditions for their safety and for their success while also allowing them the space to make the mistakes that you kind of have to make as kids. Right. Because it's it's very different. You know, it's like, you know, even, you know, being out in your neighborhood as teenage boys, just, you know, doing things that teenage boys should be just allowed to do. You know, white kids doing that. You don't even think twice a whole bunch of white kids together, you know, causing mischief or whatever. It's just mischief. Right. You know, <laughs> it's boys will be <laughs> you know, but black teenagers getting together and, you know, doing stupid things. It's, a, it's I mean, then you risk going to jail, you right. know, so it is it, it, it is hard. I, I've, I've heard so many. Um, I have a young eight year old daughter, um, but I have older nephews um, and, you know, my friends with older teenagers. And it's it's very difficult. It, it is, you know. So it's like you want your children to be free and to be able to make mistakes, but you also want the best for them in life, you know, and want them to be safe. And you know, it, and so it is. It's a it's a hard line to walk as parents and as kids. Um, I mean, hopefully, I guess there could be communication around that, you know, to say, hey, the reason that I am, I mean, it has to be, the reason I'm doing this is because other people, but then it's even hard in that and knowing that people are looking at you differently and yeah. knowing that it's like, to have an awareness of, you know, people are looking at me and thinking of me as a threat or people are looking at me and thinking of me as a criminal or people, what does that do to your own sense of self as a child? Itself. Yeah, it's a horrible thing to have yeah. to be as a kid, like it's horrible to be aware of the fact that like I need to make sure that I don't do this, I do this, I don't do that. Like it, it is its own burden to navigate the world as a black child with the knowledge of how you're being stereotyped or how you're being perceived in that way. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's hard. It gets better. I'm, I'm hopeful. Like I said, I believe in hope, but yeah, 
Yeah. Yeah. We're hoping. We yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. Another another question. Um, how did you balance writing a period piece set in the early '90s without it ever feeling like a history lesson and still feeling very vital and fresh? Well. The 90s doesn't feel historical to me. <laughs> like, I, know, right? I, I feel personally offended whenever it's like historical <laughs> fiction. I'm like, the 90s wasn't that long ago. I was alive then. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> I, I think it's several things. I think one, one of the helpful things was that I wasn't specifically a teenager then. Since I was younger, it wasn't exactly my experience of the 90s. And so... I'm coming at it from having mostly come of age in the late 90s, early 2000s. So as much as I wanted to do the research, um, I also wanted to make sure that it felt like something that I could have gone through or somebody 10 years after that or 10 years after that. So I think my age was probably a little bit helpful in that. Um, and I think also just remembering that what's history is also what's present, right? Like what people are feeling and feeling in 2020 is what people were feeling in 1992, is what people were experiencing in 1965, is what people were experiencing in uh, 1870. So I think just looking at our shared humanity across eras is what helps with that too. Um, and also not trying to make things too, too stereotypically 90s. So it's not just like, I'm just throwing all the 90s slang in there, just all, all of that in there. So it's like walking the tightrope between having fun with the era, but not making it so that you don't recognize the commonalities across eras. Yeah, no, I think that's, it's so true. And I think, you know, um, I, I, I agree with that question because your book felt so fresh. And I feel like it's the exactly what you said about the characters. They are human. And so no matter what era you live in, you are human. And so you're going to be responding in these human ways. And that's what comes across is just them in the moment having the experience that they're having. And so that's it feels super fresh. But you do. I mean, you break you give us some history lessons. And without feeling like it, it's history, without it being preachy, but I know I learned it's like the founders of LA. I was like, word, like what? Like, I don't know, that's not necessarily giving anything away. So, do you want to talk about the history and the, the founding of LA? I thought that was yeah. super cool. So, I, I'm, I am a huge history buff. I love reading history and I love understanding the context of how we get to be who we are as a society. Um, and so for me, history just feels like, especially when it comes to race relations in the United States, it contextualizes so much. It, it, it allows us to understand how we get to our present moment. It understands what we've done um, historically. It understands, it helps us understand how to be the best advocates we can be um, moving forward in life. So to me, history is always like a really interesting way to uh, reflect on our present and especially somewhere like LA in the 90s um, LA in the 90s was struggling with uh, an influx of immigrants and people's response to that and and people having kind of a, a very anti-immigrant stance at some mm -hmm. point in the 90s with Prop 187 that happens um, and also, I think because in the 90s, we're in the crack era and we're in the gang era and we're seeing the impact of the war on drugs on South LA and on um, black and brown families. And to me, it was important to showcase that we we are not the source of societal ills, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Like, I think oftentimes black and brown people are treated as not belonging to a space, as, as, as being um, part of what's wrong about a space. And so for me to showcase the fact that LA is founded by black and CISO and Latinx people, like that is who we are from our inception. That was super important to me to say, we've always been here. It's not just been like, oh, we just happened to pop up and then they were in the city. It's like, no, we are part of the founding of Los Angeles and part of what made it thrive. And 
a street like Pico that we drive down all the time if you live in LA, that's named after a black Latinx person. So mm. I, I think to me, history as a context for understanding where you are and the contributions of black and brown people to our present. And also just the fact that I think that our contributions to not only national history, but local history oftentimes gets ignored. So I'm all about being like, hey, wait a minute, like, you guys are gonna learn something. <laughs> really. Yeah, no, it, it is, I mean, it's so true. Uh, the people in power are the people writing the history and you're not learning about that in history. But that was my first time ever, ever reading that. And I lived in LA, LA for a number of years and I didn't, I didn't know that, you know, it, it's, it's, it's very intentional. It's very mm -hmm. intentional what history gets taught and then what history gets excluded and, right. and who is made to look good and who is made to look bad about the 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 history that we tell it's it's so it's such an interesting i think thing growing up and you read in your history books and i know when i grew up when i read in a history book i would think this is fact this is exactly how it happened this is the whole story it's like you know i think that's one of the most interesting things about you know coming into adulthood um, and then even of these times when so many people are trying to change that and give a fuller perspective of, you know, what really went down, you know, in this country um, in particular, um, it's been, it's been, it's been amazing. It's been, you know, stamped is another wonder. Yes. I mean, you I know, Jason, like somewhere. <laughs> yeah, Jason wouldn't want us calling it a history book, but it's, <laughs> it's a wonderful. I, purchased it. I can like talk that I have no relation to other than that I think it's important. It's very, very important in changing your perspective about the history of this country. Um, yeah. Such an important book, such an important book. Okay, um, did you, another question. Um, I should be seeing y'all's names. Um, Kanisha, I'm sorry I didn't say everybody else's. Hey, Amy and Kayla before. But um, um, hey, y'all, I know I can't, we can't see y'all's faces, so it's a little, anyway. But okay, did you worry your character would get pigeonholed as anti-Black since she was from a wealthy background and related to that lifestyle? Yes, I did, and I think, um, one of the worst things you can do as maybe a new writer is look at Goodreads <laughs> when the, oh. thing, the reviews first start trickling in because I, I, I've been fortunate to have overall very positive feedback but there were some people who were like I hate Ashley, Ashley doesn't feel black or Ashley doesn't feel um, she's not likable which I mean arguably she's not likable uh, but it's, I, I think once again, we go back to this idea of there being one version of blackness that people understand. And the version of blackness that Ashley is dealing with is one that struggles with blackness, which is true of a lot of black people who grew up in non-black areas, especially back then. So I, I, for me, as much as I was afraid that she would be misunderstood, it was more important to be honest and I think that there are a lot of people who grow up not seeing themselves on the page, right? Like there are a lot of black kids who grow up as the tokens in their school or who grow up um, isolated from the community in that way and have to find their way into a sense of community as they get older. And I hadn't really read a book like that. Um, I, I I can't think of that many off the top of my head where it's, it's coming from a perspective of Ashley's like a fish out of water in her own pond. So she belongs to this wealthy neighborhood. She belongs with this wealthy friend group. She's not a kid who is coming in from elsewhere to this neighborhood. Um, she's of this place and 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 still feels like she doesn't belong. Um, and, and why is that? Because I think oftentimes black characters, when they're uh, showcased in private schools, it's because they're a scholarship kid or they're coming in for a better life, blah, 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 blah. And that's so often been the narrative. And and Ashley's kind of like a Carlton Banks, right? Like <laughs> for those of you who know Fresh Friends, like yeah. and she's like Hillary, she's like Ashley, where these are her people. Um, yeah. and, and she's having to grow a better sense of self and community. So as much as I was afraid of that, I just wanted to be honest to that and to 
to write that experience down for those kids who haven't seen themselves on the page in that way. Yeah, and I'm, I'm happy you did because I've known so many Ashleys in my life you know, personally, I grew up in a in a in a around mostly predominantly white people, but because I've been inside and outside of the black experience, you know, it's like my church. I went to church all the time around a ton of black people. But then in you know in elementary, it's like the black girls was like, you know, you talk too white, and you know we're not messing with you like that, you know. But you know, you know, I've I've been all over the place, but I have known you know women, black women who felt very outside of the black experience. But you know what? I have not read one like that. Right. I have not read one. And it and and so you captured a truth. You know, whether it be, uh, it's a truth of the human experience. You know, it's like, and that's when it goes to kind of the conversation we were having in the beginning about characters being likable versus mm -hmm. human. It, it, Ashley was very human. It's like she could walk right out the page and I could be like, girl, Ashley, you know. <laughs> But, you know, likability is not always something that, you know, is it's going honest. to happen when we're yeah. going after truth. When we're going after truth, you're not always going to be likable. Right. Um, it's very yeah. I mean, truth be told, you know, everybody out there talking about likability. Uh, I bet you have some moments where you probably have not been very likable. Uh. <laughs> Most people will have moments where they have not been likable. I know I've had my, everybody has had moments. I know. <laughs> and I think also, like for example, there was a girl I knew in college who, at USC, would be like, "I'm not typical." She was a black girl who would say this about herself: "I'm not typical." Mm -hmm. And if you break down what that means, like, what is she saying with that comment? Because I remember I used to make fun of her for saying it, but it's because she doesn't feel connected to a stereotypical image of what black people are. But then what is that internalized racism that she feels like she's not that, right? Like that she feels the need to be like, those are those people, those are not me. Right. Um, uh, so I think that there's there are people who experience that in different ways and it can be very unlikable. I did not like that girl, yeah. but it's, it's, it's true and it's honest and it's, it's just kind of, um, once again, we're not a monolith and that's okay. And that's okay. And I feel like the juxtaposition, you know, of the story situated around the the race riots and her not feeling, it, it's perfect. It, 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 oh. It's so good. It's so good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <stop. laughs> okay, y'all, any more? Because we have like two minutes and 30 seconds left. So if y'all have some questions, y'all better come with it. Because we're about to be done. <laughs> and so is there anything else like that you um, that we didn't talk about, you know, with regard to the book that you want or that you felt or that, you know, you like to touch Ooh. on or. So I think another thing that's important for me to touch on is just girlhood in general. Like, Ashley is struggling so much with just what I think a lot of girls struggle with, which is um, how to be good when society places so many constraints on girlhood and so many, like, you have to be a certain way, but you cannot be this way mm -hmm. and you express yourself um, in this capacity, but not in this capacity. And, and that gets layered uh, because of her racial identity, but also just her friendships and her friendships not serving her anymore at some point. I feel like most teenagers and young adults can relate to having people in your life for years and years who no longer serve you. Um, and even adults, right? Like at some point in your adulthood, there are people where you're like, I loved you when I was 20. I can't deal with you now that I'm 30 or <laughs> whatever the case may be, right? So um, I think hopefully there's a lot of stuff that's universal about girlhood, about family, about sisterhood. Ashley's relationship with her sister is a problem. Yeah. Um, but I think that a lot of times sister relationships are either like, we absolutely love each other, we absolutely hate each other. And Ashley's relationship with Joe isn't that. It's just that like these two girls are very different and they're struggling to understand each other, but they love each other deeply. Yeah. Um, so I think I just wanted to write as layered a book as possible. And you, success, success. Put it all in, it it all in there and it all worked together beautifully. Success. <laughs> Thank you. Success. 
So I think we are coming to the end. Thank we you for joining us. I really yeah. appreciate you guys taking time and time out of your day to hang yes. out. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you everyone so much for tuning in. Thank you especially to Christina and Liar for that wonderful talk. Uh, that was awesome. Uh, again, if you'd like to purchase Christina's book, you can click that green button down there. Um, but with that all said, thank you so much and have a good night. Thank you guys. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>